thank you, like, like always, to, to Mo for inviting me here to this event. Um, my talk is more conceptual. It's more about the transformation I think we are living in our society. And so I'm, I'm going to talk mostly why Bitcoin, blockchain, and all the waves of transformation we are assisting are, are relevant for our society. All of us have assisted to the transformation that the Internet of Information did to our society. We can now access vast amounts of information and communicate with anybody in the world from the palm of our hands. That was something of a science fiction book 25 years ago. So that transformation, that abundance in the access to knowledge and communications that the Internet provided, the Internet of Information provided, transformed multiple industries. Transformed the media industry, the communications industry. It even transformed how the opinion in our societies is shared. But there's something that that Internet could not change. That something is the transfer of value. And very likely, you know, you might think that you are transferring value through the Internet when you go to the online banking or to a marketplace to buy something. But the truth is that that's just a mimic of actual transfer, because what you are really doing is asking intermediaries to do the transfer for you. What you are using is private networks of transfer of value that communicate among each other to update the balances in, the, in your accounts and in the destination account. So basically, for many, many years in the Internet, the, the transfer of value was done by intermediaries. And indeed, that's something that is not new. That's something that enabled the global society we live in. That's how we used to give Marco Polo our goal in Venice, and he could give us a little piece of paper that we could redeem in Beijing, Pekin back then, almost for the same amount of gold. Of course, uh, Marco Polo had his cat, no? So, so this intermediation was key for the creation of a global society, and it was not only applied to the financial system, it was also applied to the political system. So when we vote a representative, what we are doing is transferring the rights of our political value into that representative so he can administer that value for a period of time. So we are using intermediation as a way to scale our societies. The intermediation, the representative system, were scaling tools for our society. They enable, in a time where moving from city to city would take maybe weeks or months, to coordinate vast amounts of the population. So it was a coordination tool for our societies. But now we know that intermediation is not perfect. And I would say that's the reason why half of the population in our world is excluded and has no access to the very basic financial services. So in that sense, we know interoperability between these private networks of transfer of value is limited or incomplete. That creates inefficiencies and creates a costly and very slow system in the transfer of value. And also we know that you know, these representatives have sometimes, when the value they accumulate and handle is, huge enough, is big enough, they have more incentives to service their own uh, interest than to serve those they represent. So now we can say that we reach the maximum inefficiency of this representative model, of this scaling solution we found a few hundred years ago. So the question is, why, if the Internet we all know and live could change so many aspects in our society, couldn't touch the transfer of value? And the reason is relatively simple. Information can be replicated almost infinitely without cost. 
So how you know that if I have a digital piece, a, a digital object or a property, I'm not going to replicate that property ad infinitum? And this was a question that didn't have an answer until 10 years ago. And this is a question that you know, made the, industry, the music industry change their business model. They had to stop selling CDs, and instead they had to take the artists back uh, on the road. They had to start selling songs or subscriptions to music uh, streams. So the whole industry changed because of this problem, because people suddenly could start you know, sharing their music, their movies, to anybody they wanted without asking for permission. So the question is then, we have no option, we have to rely on intermediaries, we have to cope with the fact that half of the population is unbanked and outside of our system, and also with the fact that access to, to liquidity or to funding for small businesses and entrepreneurs is hard or almost non-existent in many areas of the, of the world. And as I said, if you asked me 10 years ago, I would say, yes, that's how things work. That's what it is. But 10 years ago, nine years ago, almost 10, something incredible happened, and the first network for the transfer of value without intermediaries appeared. And as you all know, that network is Bitcoin. And very likely, uh, many of you, when I say Bitcoin, think, but I thought that Bitcoin was a currency. I use this uh, picture of the Parthenon because if you go there, you will see a lot of rocks and very likely, uh, you know, uh, break down buildings and, and um, monuments. But if you study, you will know that that's the cradle of the Western civilization. So uh, we only see what we know. And that's true for Bitcoin as well. So many people were thinking about Bitcoin as a currency. Um, and, and this is not something new. We did the same with the PCs, where we thought it, they were like powerful typewriters, and now we know they are much more than that. And even very smart people could not see the potential of the Internet back in the 90s and compare the Internet with the fax machine. So that's part of our nature. It's very tough for us to see the full potential of disruptive technologies right from the get-go. So what we do is we try to match them with our, the, the, our familiar things. So currency, of course, is one of the most familiar things we use in our daily life. So that's what we thought Bitcoin was. And of course, there are companies using Bitcoin as a payment means. So that's happening. I would say that's one of the first use cases. Bitcoin is the more, most efficient remittance network. Even with high fees, even with fees of one, two bucks, it's still much more efficient than the SWIFT system because if I want to send money from Buenos Aires to Siberia, I need to wait maybe a week and pay $25, $40. And with Bitcoin, I can do that in 10 minutes and one or two bucks at most. So it's still we have a very clear use case for this network as a remittance network. It's the best remittance network in the world at the moment. And of course, we have the store of value, you know, because you know, long-term money doesn't need to be stable. Long-term money needs to preserve value in the long run. And short-term money can be stable, but not necessarily preserve value in the long term. To give you an example, in Argentina, our currency depreciates 30% per year. And still people hold it to pay coffee, but no, nobody in his same mind would store it for leaving it for their grandchildren. So that's another use case. Bitcoin might be a good long-term money, even though it's highly volatile and not good for daily usage. But Bitcoin is much more than that. Bitcoin is a technology, a platform, a game theory system. And you know, those, the, the main components of Bitcoin are the blockchain, which many of you might know. So I, I just did this simple depiction of, of a blockchain so everybody can recall the concepts. 
that's an easy way to, say, to show it. No, no, this is a joke, of course. But this is how you will see blockchain depicted from a technological point of view. But blockchain is no more, no less than a ledger. An immutable ledger, a ledger with high auditability capabilities, is just a way to record data in a reliable way. But Bitcoin without uh, somebody protecting that database, you know, somebody is no more, no less than a database. And if a hacker gets into that database and change it, you know, that's it. I mean, information is gone. I might say that something changed, but I don't, know, I don't recall what was the original version. So Bitcoin added a game theory element to it. And once these pages in this ledger are linked together, somebody's contributed economic, contributing economical value. So the miners are providing and economic, they are providing electricity, computing resources to secure those ledgers. And if they try to betray the system, then they already did the investment, but they don't get the reward. So they stay honest because they have an economic incentive to do so. It's not only technological security, it's economical security. And of course, Bitcoin went, added another element and said, OK, I will have thousands of copies around the world that when new information arrives for the ledger, I will validate it independently. So even if somebody managed to tweak the information, if it doesn't comply with the rules, I'm not accepting the, that. And that's why Bitcoin, with you know, almost 300,000 uh, millions at, at some billions at some point, was not hacked. Because you know, this is a mixture of elements. It's independent validation security, uh, economical security, the combination of elements is what makes Bitcoin very, very secure. But when we combine these elements, when we have an open blockchain secured by a decentralized network, we are in the face of something new, something revolutionary. And that something new is the Internet of Value, the first network of networks for the transfer of value. And much like the Internet of Information was built in layers, and you know, we first built the technology to make computers and humans communicate, and many years later, we started to combine those technologies into emerging patterns like social networks. Even though the technology maybe was in the 90s, social networks emerged just you know, a few years ago, around 10 years ago. In the same way, the Internet of Value is going to be building layers. So the store of value that Bitcoin provided us was the first layer, but now we know we need decentralized business logic. And in the future, we'll, and we are seeing this, we will be building different infrastructure layers to scale these to service billions of users and to simplify the access to these technologies. Smart contracts, the decentralized business logic, is revolutionary because it's enabled us to have the equivalent of a legal system that is autonomously run by a decentralized network. So now we have the opportunity to go beyond transfer of money into the settlement of agreements between parties. And that's very powerful because the base of our society is a programming language that is called the law. And the judicial system is the computer that runs that programming, those programs. And the contracts are the programs of our society, and the lawyers are the hackers. So <laughs> go figure. <laughs> kind of. But how this change our society? First thing, I know how many of you know, I'm running out of time, but how many of you know what all these bills have in common, all these banknotes have in common? Raise your hand. <laughs> they are all gone. They are issued privately by banks, is correct? Privately. The, the one in the middle has is from 900. The rest are 150 years old. So private money was the money in existence you know, for many, many years and until very recently. So why money is issued by the governments? Because the trust in those independent parties issuing money was lost. So governments took over. But with these technologies, we have the opportunity to regain this tool for society and create communitary and complementary currencies to enable and, and make our communities thrive. 
Then, of course, the second use case, you know, this concept, everybody, the Uber off. So we are assisting with ICOs, token sales, and all the securitization, utility tokens. We are assisting uh, uh, to the Uberization of crowdsourcing. So that's the, second the third use case, store of value, remittances, crowdfunding. And of course, we need to go a long way to add governance to these processes, to improve the transparency in the process and balance the economical and political rights of the investors and the entrepreneurs. But we are into something. This can be the future of, BC, of the BC business. And then we have social scaling. Human beings are limited to 150 you know, in, uh, links of trust, bonds of trust with other individuals. And as I said, representation was the first scaling solution we found. With this, we have social contracts that can scale to hundreds of thousands or millions of individuals. And Bitcoin is proof of that. Bitcoin has a very simple, smart contract, you know, that has been run for nine years and nobody can, could break it. So now we have real scalable social contracts. Now we have to take that technology into you know, more complex social contracts and see how we can improve our societies, the transparency and efficiency of our societies. And finally, this is the, my favorite emerging pattern, we have reputation-based uh, reputation identities that can be built on this immutable ledger. So we can enable a, a, this uh, agriculture in Nicaragua to get a loan from a development bank in China or in Brazil, and if he pays, he builds reputation. Every time he studies something new, he builds reputation, and that reputation becomes its collater his collateral. So suddenly, somebody that has nothing as collateral can build a collateral out of his uh, behavior, out of his reputation and behavior through life. So if we combine this, and I'm finishing, with the fact that half of our unbanked population will have a smartphone in their hands by 2019, 2020, we are in the face of a unique opportunity to give all excluded in our society the tools and the means to thrive, to be included, and to end with poverty eventually. So thank you. Diego Gutierrez!